Good afternoon, my name is Sam Van Horn. I work at the University of Iowa. I am the ITS Assessment Director. And just to let you know, I cannot see anybody on this side of the room, so if you have a question, you will need to jump up and down, um, and I will try to see you. Or someone on this side of the room, please point out if someone over there has a question. Uh, I, I, I do feel like I'm kind of a star here, <laughs> if just because I have many lights in my eyes. Uh, my co-authors are Jane Russell from my, my office, as well as Professor Kathy Shu from the College of Education. I would also like to uh, uh, reach out and, say, and welcome the online audience today, and I look forward to engaging you as well throughout today's presentation. If you're using social media, uh, please use the please um, use me, direct things to me as well at Learning Places. Obviously, um, my phone's in my pocket. I might I'm going to be not using my phone during my presentation. Uh, but I would like to be able to participate in the conversation and whatever people may be talking about. And obviously, you know to use the regular EDUCAUSE hashtag. So, um, so I'm here to talk about assessment using multiple sources of data to support students who are using educational technology. And I just want to kind of begin by saying, um, how did we get into using electronic textbooks? Um, and I just want to say that what happened was we got a bunch of free electronic textbooks. Uh, the University of Iowa participated in a pilot project about two years ago in which, we're able to, uh, in which students were given a free e-textbook to use um, that was accessible through the course management system and that we would also be able to access the data that was connected, or collected, excuse me, in the database. So it provided a very good opportunity for us to look at how students engage with e-textbooks. And so we decided to, um, to take advantage of this opportunity, design a study, and look at these things. The, just to say really briefly, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but I do want to talk about uh, just a b basic review of the most, um, I guess, often researched areas of electronic textbooks. And I will even say, admit now, that the term electronic textbook is, some, is becoming somewhat of a misnomer. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have been walking through the exhibit hall. You have seen products from uh, companies like Pearson or McGraw-Hill um, and seeing that these, are, these actually contain a lot of different types of uh, content now and, 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 uh, and don't really look like books. Um, with respect to learning outcomes, there's been a variety of research conducted. In general, research conducted in higher education settings in which the, um, <clears throat> in which the outcome variable, say, is the, is the final grade in a course, uh, the, uh, the outcomes are generally have, been, has sh have shown no significant difference between students who use a paper textbook and students who use an e-textbook in the course. However, there's been more recent research about um, how students who use an e-book or an e-textbook uh, have learned less in conditions, more laboratory-like conditions in which people have used e-textbooks. Probably most often researched is, is what students prefer, and, and definitely the research here is split in terms of there have been studies that have shown that people uh, strongly prefer e-textbooks for reasons such as it per they have good access to it, it provides a search tool, and there's also studies that have shown that people prefer paper textbooks for reasons that they can always access it, for example. Um, <clears throat> and more recently, researchers have been trying to look at, well, what are the factors associated with students' decision to adopt e-textbooks? And a very interesting paper by Stone and Baker Evelith suggests that perceived usefulness of the tools, as well as prior satisfaction using e-textbooks, is very important when considering if I'm adopting an electronic textbook, whether, whether actually students may be on board with, with using it. Um, and those, are, those preferences are mediated in addition to price. Uh, and now that electronic textbooks, now, now that they contain, they, they provide possibilities for interaction. These are not usually, these are not just scanned PDFs anymore. People have begun to look at, well, how do students interact uh, with their instructor or with others in these interactive platforms? Uh, one relevant study by Coulier and Doolin found that while the instructor had used the tools extensively, the students, uh, most of the students had not engaged with using the learning tools, uh, learning tools at all. So primarily researchers have looked at whether students are satisfied after they're using any textbook, whether they've learned better uh, after using any textbook, but there have not been many detailed use examinations of how people are using e-textbooks throughout a term. And so that's what we really decided to do. And just to kind of just provide some brief background about what this, this e-textbook was, is that it was not optimized to use on a, a mobile device. It was optimized to use on a laptop like mine or a personal computer. It allowed for online and offline reading. It included all the basic markup tools you might find, such as the ability to highlight, add notes, uh, use annotations, submit questions to the instructor, uh, and bookmark pages for easy, for easy access later. It also included an option for sharing markup uh, tools with others. 
a search feature and then a scrubber bar, a bar at the bottom of the screen that enables people to, to quickly slide through and look for the relevant pages. Now, one thing we wanted to be sure is that when we looked at the, how people used e-textbooks, we wanted to be sure that we were looking at the main textbook for the course. So a precondition for participating in the, in the pilot and then obviously in the study was that the e-textbook e was the major textbook and that they assigned at least half of it for the course. Uh, from the students, we collected a baseline survey as well as 14 weekly reading journals that we sent to them electronically, uh, as well as a comprehensive uh, post uh, survey at the end of the semester. From the e-textbook system, we collected a large database of information about their reading as well as their usage of the different markup tools. And then we collected information about the demographic information and, and information about their prior learning outcomes and outcomes in the course from our university registrar. Uh, our, our, our research study was, was approved by human subjects. So I feel like I've described a basic study in but if we stop to think, I've just basically said that I've collected information about how, about reading from the vendor that they're going to tell us who read, and this information is going to say, well, people read or did not read the e-textbook. E but I want you to just think about this briefly. What does it mean to have read a page in an e-textbook? What would you consider the main criterion to be to say, this page has been read and this page has, been, has not been read? And so I would like to engage you in some audience participation. And for this, I actually do need volunteers. And, I, I, and you, don't have to, you don't have to come up and be on camera if you don't want to. You can do the activity here. But I do need two volunteers for a brief activity. It's painless. I, I trust you. Could I have two volunteers, please? OK, I have two volunteers. Could, could you please come forward? I, I have to stay on camera. I'm afraid if I walk off camera, people will turn me off. Mm -mm. I'm going, to hand, I'm going to hand you a paper, to, I, want to, I want to see people see, this is a paper textbook. I brought this textbook from Iowa, I want you to know, that, and I almost incurred an extra baggage fee. And this is my iPad, are you comfortable using this? Oh, quite, yes. This is Educause, you should be. <clears throat> I have directions on the slide, and, you, and the viewers and the online audience, I also have posted directions for you to use so that you can um, access the ebook version. This is a textbook, um, a biology textbook, and what I would like both of you to do now is I would like you to navigate and find page 126. And I would like you to read, both of you to read page 126. And for those of you in the audience at this time, do any of you want to, I guess, hazard a, a guess about how long it might take to read a page in a comprehensive biology textbook? You can feel free to step up to the mic and, 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 and place your bet. Or if you say, say it out loud, I will repeat it for the, I will repeat it for the online audience. 15 minutes is one guess. I believe my two people are still reading. The page is 126. It is in section 7.1. Any other guesses? Six minutes. Six minutes. People are learning biology right now. So I have 15 minutes, six minutes. Have you been able to find the page on the, on the iPad? You, that the paper textbook, the paper textbook reader has found the page. Okay. So would you like to just try reading it? Okay. I'll give you just a couple more minutes to read here. In the online audience, does anybody hazard a guess, or is anybody reading the e-textbook themselves? Does anybody want to hazard a guess about how long it may take to read? So I'm actually going to stop you right now just to ask you, just the paper textbook user, how long have you been reading, do you think? A couple minutes, three minutes? Okay. Are you close to being finished? 
You're at the bottom of the first column. Can I say two thirds? So two thirds. Okay. So what I would like to say is that is that the e-textbook vendor in which that we worked with said um, that a page in the system was counted as read when it was viewed for 10 seconds. <laughs> so this was just to illustrate that a 10 second read uh, in, a standard, in a standard textbook, if you bring that to me, I'll hold it up and I will release you from your, from your, from your duties. I might be able to read maybe one bullet point. Yes, so, one, so it's a very substantial page in a textbook. And you can see that, these, that after just several minutes that it was only half of it. So what this is sort of, what I want to kind of talk about here in my presentation today is that when we look at analytics, some of these, it's such a very hot topic that we, you know, we collect measures about reading, but do we interrogate what these numbers actually mean? What are the assumptions behind these numbers? And, do they, and are these assumptions realistic? Clearly a 10 seconds is not enough to read a page in a, in a standard textbook. And I don't think this biology textbook is, 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 out, of the, is, is out of the ordinary. Um, <clears throat> What I would like to now just ask, I'm going to ask a couple questions, so just, just for a few minutes, and, and, uh, just, just, and people, other people, could, people that were reading, and could you focus on what you were reading? Did you look at any other pages? Did you look at the page across? Uh, did it take longer than you thought it would? D did anybody, did, would the iPad user, did you have, what problems did you have? Or successes? You have to speak into the microphone, I'm sorry. Yes. So I'm not a great test case for that. But uh, the question I had earlier was too, how, do you det how did whoever determined the 10 second rule for having read the page, um, where did that come from? Because we did some of that kind of analysis too. Um, and generally speaking, I didn't have any problem. I, I read on the iPad all the time. I didn't mm -hmm. have any particular OK, issues. thank you. To, to answer your question, our account representative did not know where that number came from either. The, the number was known by the database developer. Other comments. Okay, so what does it mean? So what does it mean to have read? Obviously, that 10 seconds is too is too low of an estimate. And, and what I want to talk to you about now is this: I'm going to talk about briefly about what we found in our study. In our study, in which we examined people that used e-textbooks, we included a control group, uh, a group of students who used a paper textbook in a matched course. And what I'm going to do now is basically summarize the findings by looking at uh, the basic findings of that study before I start to look at how we look at analytics data and more subjective uh, measures in concert with each other. So we had 270 individual students in, in, our, in our research study. Uh, they were primarily uh, a female and they were mostly students who were juniors and seniors. Uh, the, the courses that participated in the pilot were primarily courses, uh, more advanced courses in the discipline. So, um, so, we, so our sample was, is definitely not representative of our university as a whole. Um, what did we learn from uh, giving these surveys and these, and these reading journals? So what did we learn from subjective measures uh, that, we, uh, that we provided or that we administered during the study? Well, what we found was that even though students had um, <clears throat> a free e-textbook, uh, about 16% of them had purchased the paper copy of the textbook and a, and a, and a small number were, had, a, had said that they were planning to buy that. So a pretty sizable number were still committed to using the paper, paper textbook. And I'll talk more, about, um, talk more about that group later. What we found when we looked at, I'm gonna show you some, I'm gonna show you some plots now. And what I'm gonna show you these plots they are uh, good visual representations of, of statistical procedures that I don't really want to go into in depth, but if, you're, if you are a statistician, please come talk to me. Essentially what we found was that throughout the semester, um, after controlling for the courses that they were in, students who used the paper textbook had greater average satisfaction using with their access to the paper textbook uh, than students' satisfaction with accessing the e-textbook all throughout the semester. Um, we learned that from their reading journals. In addition, what we found was that students, and these, these differences across time are significant, uh, statistically significant. We also found that students who used the paper textbook reported reading more. So this graph shows you number of hours reported reading for all the uh, weekly reading journals. They, they reported that they read more, and this difference was significant across time in, in the semester. At the end of the semester, 
Obviously, you might guess by seeing that e-textbook users had lower satisfaction with accessing it, lower reading times. Students in the paper group uh, felt that the e-textbook uh, were more likely to agree that the e-textbook, I'm sorry, that the paper textbook, uh, that the ability to highlight helped them to learn, that the ability to use the index was more useful for their learning, and, um, and that overall the paper textbook was more useful for their learning. So what we found in general was that students in the paper group used their textbook more um, and were more pleased with the paper textbook. So in order to talk about the, now the context of the current information where we start to look at the analytics, well, what does the analytics now focusing more specifically now just on the e-textbook group, what do we learn then if we gather this information and we work to say we, we, can, we can build these measures and now at the end of the semester we have a ginormous amount of, uh, it's essentially a big Excel spreadsheet that, uh, that then must be made sense of. Um, and so what I want to kind of illustrate to you is how we did this in the sense that this calendar shows you that we, we took all of the analytics data that we received from the vendor and, and, and basically it has a timestamp for any type of interaction, like I said, the page being read in 10 seconds, you know, hint, hint. Uh, <clears throat> and then we matched that reading data with the survey that was administered the week afterwards. So you can see we, we administer a, a reading journal on the Sunday or the Monday. We ask students to tell us, could you access your e-textbook? How much time did you spend reading your e-textbook? How satisfied were you with accessing your e-textbook? And so this is how we join that information. We can total up the number of pages that were recorded being read in the e-textbook. And we can join that with what students said that they did in the e-textbook. And does it match? And think, and think about that. What do you expect? Do you expect this information to match? To, someone said no. Someone is, someone, someone's pretty confident there. And so, uh, so we will talk about that. And because what I want to talk about is, you know, we, we live in the, we live in the era of, of uh, we're living in the era, era of big data. It, it feels like an era, just a few years, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> and that big data is the truth. Big data contains so much information that big data by itself can tell us everything we need to know about how our students might be interacting with these things. But I want to talk to you about when it may not indeed be the truth. And I want to talk to you briefly about a couple of things. And one of them is zero. What is zero? Zero is nothing. Um, when we receive a data set of analytics from a vendor, and I don't think it's that different for different vendors, what does it contain? It contains the measures of usage of people that have done things in the system. What does it not contain? It does not contain information about people that have not used specific information in the system. So the value of zero is actually a very important decision when looking at analytics. And I'm going to show you some information about we had to make that decision where we look, our first inclination was to look at information that we received from the, system, from the vendor as it was, as a measure of how people interacted with their e-textbooks. But then when we realized, we actually had a conversation with the vendor about people were missing from the system. And we had a conversation for a while. This, these people, they were in the class. They're not there. Where were they? And it took a while for us to actually accept. They actually never read the e-textbook. Our assumption was being free, that people would all be there. They would all be, have a record in there. But that wasn't true. And then I also want to talk about what, does, what can analytics tell us about, does it, what does it tell us or not tell us about the richness of reading behaviors? Um, that we also may want to know about. So what this, info, what, this, what this shows you is that if we, when we take the analytics information as it was, and if we calculate some descriptive statistics, I'm going to specifically focus on the median there on the far right of the slide, and the median is, that, is the midpoint, it's the, it's the 50th percentile of that information. Um, you can see here that while no one read their e-textbook offline, we see that on average, at least 50% of the people obviously read their e-textbook, and 50% of the people used the markup tools um, in the e-textbook. <clears throat> but what this table shows you is that if we go in, and this takes a little bit of, you know, this takes a wrench and some tools, but if we go in and then say, if we know all these people were actually in these courses, and if we add them in the system, and if we add in the zeros, what we actually don't have is we actually don't have missing data, which is a, a great thing from a statistics perspective. But we actually can say specifically that there was, um, where it says the median is undefined, that less than half of the people actually use that tool. 
So, what, so when we actually look at specific usage, when we actually count the people that have not used the tool, we actually see that this information is a lot less. So it's very important. The, the concept of zero is actually a very important, I would argue, in looking at, at, at analytics. Um, <clears throat> analytics is also quite messy, right? So here are plots for, the, for, the, for, the, um, for all of the e-textbook courses, the mean number of pages read uh, at that time point for weeks three, six, nine, and 12 throughout the semester. Uh, it's, it's, you know, so at what analytics is also, it's also it can be difficult to interpret. Maybe we see, we see one course that's much higher than the rest. We do see a general downward trend where most of the lines are converging closer to zero at, uh, at, at the end of the semester. Um, but we also looked at, in, we also, I'm sorry, we also looked at individual reading data. So what we, we could look at how much students said that they read in the e-textbook for, I mean, for the duration, how many hours they spent. And we also could measure the number of pages that were actually read for the 10 seconds during that period that we asked them about. So what do you expect to see? If someone reports that they read for one hour and another person, and they say, well, I read for five hours, do you, what do you expect to see? And actually, this is a question I'm asking the audience here. If someone who re re reads for, do you expect to see five times the number of pages read. So someone who reads for an hour read 20 pages. Someone who reads, reads for five hours, did they read 100 pages? Are there any? Could you approach a microphone, please? Not necessarily, because it depends on the subject, the student's prior experience with the subject, how fast the student can read, what kind of distracting environment they were in, et cetera, et cetera. So you can. Yes get a general sense if you have enough data points, you may be able to plot out a, a line. But um, with just a few, especially with the small number of students that you have in your sample here, mm -hmm. it, whether you can get any kind of plot, it's questionable. OK. So maybe not. Other ideas, other thoughts? Would, would I see five times the number of pages read? Thank you. I'd expect you to see less than five times the number of pages read. Okay, um, and why? Why would you expect to see less? Well, I think there's more opportunity for distraction. Um, people might linger over something. They, it took them five hours because they read slower. Uh, okay. There are a lot of possibilities. Um, also, at 10 seconds a page, they could read 1,800 pages in five hours. That's probably more than the whole textbook. Right, I think you, yes. <laughs> that is total number of pages read. So the, the, the number of pages I'm showing you is not unique pages. It's so there could be multiple page, there could be multiple instances of the same page, yes. So what so what we did then was that we actually plotted. Um, we use a procedure to look at what we would expect if we could plot the number of uh, <clears throat> the number of pages read as a function of what's of, as, as a function of what the of the duration that students said that they read. And what we find actually is an interesting relationship. What we find is that there's a small increase between that zero to one hour. So if you're looking at that x-axis, you're seeing that small increase. Or there, if there's a difference there, yes, there's an di increase in the number of pages read. But then that, that line stays completely flat uh, until about six or seven hours when it starts to, to rise up again. <clears throat> and so interestingly, when students, we might expect from when we see the subjective measures in our study, we thought, well, these larger readers, they must be seeing more pages. They must be consuming a lot of content. Perhaps this speaks to the idea that they were studying, that they were spending more time lingering over the content. And we're actually looking at that. We're actually pairing qualitative information to look at what they reported about the richness of their reading with some of these people who's, who reported reading for, uh, for longer durations there. Now, interestingly, I also told you that or the early part of the session that we collect information about who bought a paper textbook at the beginning of the term. And this line is showing you the students that did not report buying any, uh, a paper textbook. Uh, but that we, we find is a difference in that the students who, the students who, who, who reported buying a paper textbook uh, read throughout the semester were, more, were read less uh, than, the people, than the people who read and, and um, who, people who never purchased a, a paper textbook. So one of the important things we find from subjective measures early in the semester with respect to e-textbooks is that those early attitudes are very important in assessing in terms of if I have a class, who is more likely to be, am I likely to engage? Who is more likely to abandon this, this, um, this, uh, this e-textbook? And what we found was that these early subjective measures, which are much more accessible to us than analytics data, uh, can be very important for decision making like that. Um, <clears throat> what we also found was that 
an increasing number of students who said that they, a lot of people said, by the end of the semester said they were reading their e-textbook, but I don't know what they were reading, but it was not their e-textbook. So, um, so, so these are people that said that they read the e-textbook, but they actually did not. And I actually can't tell you what they read. And maybe they were lying about what they read. Uh, <clears throat> and, so, uh, what were they, and so what were they doing there uh, <clears throat> speaks to the idea that perhaps there was more abandonment of the e-textbook as time went on. Um, but those subjective measures, correlating those with the information that we got from the data set shows that uh, increasingly students, what students said they were reading was not actually what we were measuring um, in the e-textbook. So I've talked to you about the main findings of our study and how we've put together different information, putting together the information from the reading journals that we gathered along with the database of e-textbook usage. And I want to talk now kind of briefly about some of these challenges of working with analytics information. Um, <clears throat> because we went in this uh, gung-ho thinking we would have a large amount of data. And what we found was that the people that we worked with in the company didn't understand the data as much, like we didn't understand it. Like, I, like the example I gave you about the number of pages read or what a red page stood for. Um, we all didn't know these things. And we, and we knew that essentially we always, there was always a database person that I wasn't allowed to talk to um, that the question would get filtered back to and the answer would come um, back to me. <clears throat> um, usage of users have different identifiers. So in our study, students participated more than one time um, because they ended up being in several courses that were using an e-textbook. We gave them a different subject identifier, but the e-textbook vendor gave them one. And so the actual data management of trying to merge information that you collect with a separate identifier is actually not a trivial task. And it does require pretty significant data management skills that we found that, that you actually have to do. Um, <clears throat> and what actually the, perhaps the biggest lesson that we learned was that we thought we would have this very rich database of e-textbook tools to examine. It would let us look at how people interacted with the content. Who was more likely to use these tools faster? Who was more likely to, were, was that associated with any learning outcomes that we could measure? And what we found was that we had such little incidence of tool usage that it actually doesn't give us enough power. Um, so we actually could not find in our study uh, any ability to say anything about anything related to students' measures, measures of their prior learning. So we couldn't talk about maybe lower performing students were more likely to use these tools or not, demographic information. Um, <clears throat> and what we found was that because the instructors primarily had used this e-textbook as a substitute paper text, all but one had never used an e-textbook before. All but one used the paper textbook themselves and all but one never scaffolded the adoption of these, of these e-textbook tools. So the assumption that we had at the beginning that, there would, that this usage would naturally occur, uh, we found was, was basically erroneous. And that if I was doing this again, <laughs> and before I was going to dive into this, it would be important to understand, is there something happening in the instructional design that's going to promote this usage that would then make it more meaningful to look at? And would there be more actual interaction that would be interesting to look at? Now, I know I'm not the only one. Um, this is my experience working with analytics type of information. Other people are in the audience, I'm sure, have experience. What other challenges I would like to ask you of doing analytics research from planning to looking at this information to interpreting it? What other challenges have you experienced? And I'll pose that question to the online audience as well. There's, I don't think there's a mic in the back. I think these are the only two. So. I was in a session like this last year, and mm -hmm. D2L was looking at similar data, and there was a big issue of quality versus quantity. Sure. They discovered that students who spent more time on a page and highlighted more did poorly, more poorly, on an exam. And it turned out that there was an inverse correlation because those students didn't have any ability to discern what was important, so they were highlighting everything. And it, it, turned out to be counterintuitive because we were looking for more activity when we should have been looking for more quality. So did you see anything like that in your studies? We saw that highlighting was the most common tool uh, to be used. We saw that people highlighted extremely large passages, um, so large that it's hard for us to discern what might have been important in a passage because it, you can just click and drag. Um, so I can't really speak to the exact outcome, but we did see a lot of 
uh, very frequent highlighting, um, as if to say that it wasn't sure what was important. Other uh, challenges? Uh, similar uh, comment, and I think um, and the whole notion of highlighting or using the note-taking tools in the books is really interesting. That There's been some recent studies, um, uh, online e-textbooks notwithstanding, that highlighting actually doesn't help you understand the material that you're reading. So whether you're doing it in an e-book or you're doing it in a paper book, um, and I was a notorious highlighter in my textbook, but apparently that wasn't actually helping me. Other things I did helped me more. So I think the real challenge in the analytics and understanding the science of the data is what actually is meaningful to look at. Yes. Um, we made some assumptions early on in our own e-textbooks that, um, that highlighting, we called it, was a proxy for engagement. Right, so we didn't know what to look at, so we started looking at highlighting because we could and note taking because it was easy to capture. Um, and we were wrong. So, um, what is really changing student behavior? What is actually improving student uh, performance? Um, I don't think there are answers yet in terms of how the textbook and how content actually fit, fits in there, other than some of the things we know about re reinforcement of content with short chunks of data and, and again, quizzing often um, throughout the book. Um, but, but the whole notion, we have way more data than we have an understanding of what it means, and so that's been my, my experience and my challenge. Thank you. I think an, another challenge, and, and I'm not sure if you guys had this experience with the vendor, is that um, the vendors with the different platforms that they provide or tools provides, as you say, like potentially very rich data but also because they're not part of your research team, the data is sometimes um, very complex or doesn't come in a way that is easy to analysis. Mm -hmm. So I think for, for Duke University, um, I know our program evaluators talked about clickstream data and how it would be really nice to get into that, but we'll probably have, to, if we're going to get into it, it's, it's gonna require way more programming ability and capacity than than our small team yes. can, can do on its own. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think it's a very uh, interesting point. It'd be interesting to other people's thoughts about that, the time investment that goes into understanding and making it manageable. Hi, I'm, I'm new to the, to the topic of uh, analytics. My background is a um, uh, former uh, English education professor and work now with uh, helping out with the assessment of student learning outcomes. and. Um, a little bit of quick context for the challenge that I'm wrestling with right now that maybe somebody can help me with. I approach assessment with faculty as this is about asking and answering questions mm -hmm. about how effective the curriculum is. And so what you want to do is to go out and sample the things that the students are making or doing because they're participating in your curriculum. And then you use a construct called a rubric to assess that performance, and from that you can make inferences about how effective that curriculum is. But you're looking at direct student products, presentations, papers, examinations, field work as student teachers, and things like that. What's interesting to me, what I'm hearing through two days about analytics is we're not looking at the actual student production. We're looking at proxies I think that's a, a useful word I've heard used several times. Proxies for their engagement with the educational experience. I find that absolutely fascinating. I've heard you, your presentation, query the validity of what inferences you could draw about their engagement as readers through mm -hmm. this study. I don't know if that's a fair summary of what, you, what you're finding here. The question I have, and I'm going to keep pushing, is is there a way to wed what analytics is able to describe with the work that we're doing in student learning outcomes to go out and capture samples of authentic student work so that then we can come back and say something about the effectiveness of the curriculum. And I'll end my long comment there. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very prescient question and comment. Does, does anybody have a response for that? I thought that there was a very interesting questions being posed in terms of collecting those other more relevant artifacts. Did I get it right in my account of analytics? 
He said, did he, he said, he asked if he got it right in his account I, of analytics. I'm kind of testing my schema that I'm building here about <laughs> analytics with you. That's my old reading teacher background. You build a schema and then sometimes you have to have that schema deconstructed in order to move on and develop a new one. Yes. I see this as a conundrum between inputs and outputs. You're measuring all the inputs, how many pages they read, how much mm -hmm. they highlighted, but you're looking for the outputs. How did they do on the assessments or what's the quality of, yeah. So that's the bridge there, and I think that's the holy grail for us. If we can connect the inputs and the outputs, then we have actionable analytics. I've, I think that's a very, very interesting idea to consider. We have time for perhaps one more comment, and then I just have a couple more slides, and, there's, and there'll be time for questions, so it's not that I'm going to... I just wanted to jump in and say that, that we can't, there's so many things that we can't measure, mm -hmm. and the things that we can measure aren't always telling us the things that we think they are. So time on page, for example, um, I can read for an hour and I can look at a certain number of pages, but you don't know really what I was doing during that time. Mm -hmm. And so we make the assumptions that you know, a student is actually reading it, um, or a student, because they clicked on a video, and it, and it played through that they actually watched the video that they didn't get up and walk away. Um, and so this is a problem we have with a lot of different um, educational technologies that the student does off-site somewhere that just because they've clicked doesn't mean that they were actually sitting in front of the device while the device was playing or showing yes. them the content. I think that that's just one of the most important things. And, and sort of people have kind of commented on uh, also looking at these inputs and outputs. From my perspective, an educational technology office, vendors tout these tools as boosts to student learning. And if we don't see adoption, why have the tools? And so I think that the, peop the, the agendas that people have kind of outlined are very excellent ones. In our office, you know, we, th there's an assertion made about a tool, and then there's myself and my team that's going to say, does the, does the assumption bear out? And you're exactly right in the sense of analytics may show us information, but it doesn't show us anything about the richness of that information. So it may, it may count some type of reading, but it doesn't show us the quality of that reading. And it is really important to, to understand those limitations. Just, just, briefly going to, just briefly going to wrap up here and just say that, um, <clears throat> just because I want to have time for more questions, is just that in terms of research, if it's important to you to look at how people may be engaging in these systems and whether these are profitable things to look into, um, not profitable in a monetary sense, but uh, good for our students, is that um, talking to vendors early was important. So what we were able to do is negotiate a data dump early in the semester so that we could actually see what we were getting and actually make sense of it so that when the final thing came, we actually knew what was to, to, to do. Uh, have a meeting with your IRB. Um, I don't think anybody from my IRB is watching me, so I'm going to say this. Your IRB does not understand what analytics is. My IRB is more concerned about how I recruit students, and I could put all the information that I wanted to collect, and I, ne and I never received one question about that, which I actually think is kind of concerning for the IRB as well. But it's important to talk to your IRB if you're planning to do human subjects research, which, which we did. And we received a approval for everything we got. And one brief example I want to give you about how this worked was that we got, for example, approval to collect all the notes that students put in. The vendor did not want to provide us notes that were hidden from other students. But we made the assertion that actually they gave us consent to give us all of their notes. And so the vendor provided us with the notes. There are lots of small negotiations like that that happen. It's not as if there's an agreement that says, we're going to provide you the data that you need in order to assess this effectively. It's an ongoing, it's an ongoing conversation. And luckily, we were able to have those conversations, um, asking questions and more questions. What does something mean? There's a record here. Something happened. Uh, what does that actually mean? Um, understanding, and I think we've talked about it, important to understand the, the, uh, the limitations of, the, of looking at big data and, and what people have talked about, the cost of looking at it in terms of hours spent examining something. Like I said, you know, all of that information that we looked at the markup usage, but because of the small amount, it doesn't actually help us very much. Um, <clears throat> and consider where these subjective assessment, uh, you know, in the form of reading journals really gave us a lot of good information that we needed and was accessible well-designed and grounded in the literature about what we know about adoption uh, was, was, was very useful for us. Just briefly, what my team and I are doing now, uh, e-textbooks are not going away. Uh, I've accepted that, and 
Um, they're very heavily adopted in introductory STEM courses. So what we're doing now is more intervention work. Learning about the obstacles that students had to reading electronic content and accessing e-textbooks, we actually are designing intervention materials that we're testing in these classes to see if students are more likely to, um, to use them. Because we still tend to find that, for example, in our current study in our intro biology class, that 80% of the students, though required to have the electronics, still buy the paper. Um, so we do think it's important. We do think it's important to look at this adoption. Um, I, I have references to the slide here. I just want to acknowledge we received a grant from Consortium of College and University Media Centers. I took a picture from Flickr, um, and I would take, I believe we have about just seven minutes for questions. So if there's other questions, um, I'll take them now, or comments, including from online. Please, uh, you approach the... Uh, just a disclosure, I'm probably one of those evil vendors, but uh, one thing I thought was really glad you highlighted is uh, we have the converse issue where we often want to work with people on developing these things, and analytics is a particularly hard area to develop. And uh, getting the kind of support you have given your vendor in terms of getting involved early and having the, those constructs to define what we're going to collect, because one of the biggest challenges with analytics is until you've started seeing people using it and have those discussions, often you don't know what data you want to collect. Mm -hmm. And uh, framing that is very, very difficult. So the first thing my developer will ask me is, what do you want me to collect? What data do you want me to collect? And it's just hard to come up with, I'll just say collect whatever you can, collect everything, every <laughs> click, every, every little second. So that, that's a big challenge. And the second thing uh, with analytics is at least a lot of the discussions I've been having with a lot of people, I've been involved in this only for the last about six, six seven months. And every time I have an analytics discussion, um, analytics is seen as the solution. It's like, it's, it's not the solution. It's, it's a tool to support something else you're trying to do. And it's important for us to understand what is that thing you're trying to achieve that analysts try to support. It's, I have a bit of a marketing background. You look at Google Analytics, and years ago, we figured out time spent needs nothing. <laughs> you know, that's why Google uh, has spent so much time setting up things like conversion and goals and stuff like that. And that mm. suddenly makes sense for marketing. So I think the similar things apply here. And analytics is just such an early stage that until we understand what we're applying this to and how this is going to support pedagogy, I don't think we're going to be able to solve this uh, conundrum that we've got with time spent. So it's just a comment. Thank you. I have an online question. Do you do have an online question? Any correlation, either positive or negative, between time spent reading and outcomes? Example, grades on assignment, overall class grades. Yes. So this is, um, there is no correlation with time spent reading uh, that, that we found. What we did find, though, uh, was um, in the data was an interaction between time spent reading and frequency of uh, bookmark usage, so, which could, um, and I'm hesitant to say it because we haven't replicated it, uh, but in this study we did find, and it may be explained, that frequent reading along with a bookmarking strategy that enabled people to find information uh, may have helped them to be learning it. Uh, to, to learn better, and it does make sense because the bookmarking tool was helpful for finding things. But I would hesitate to say that we found that once, uh, and we haven't tried, we haven't replicated it. it does the system permit one student to read another student's e-text? It permits a student to they're they're sharing the e-text. It permits them to read their notes. Right, the other but, students' notes. Okay, but if they're shared, could a friend lend a student his access to the e-textbook? Not in this case. They would sh they would share their university password. The ah. e-textbook was contained in the LMS. Well, I hesitate to say that would never happen, but <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking it might provide an explanation for the people who claim to have done reading and didn't show so in the system and might also present an additional complication yes, in analyzing the, the, the data you have. And which might actually be why it was hard to access for people is that it was buried in the LMS. So, so, so went the LMS, so went your e-textbook. Um, 
we did a similar e-textbook study at the University of Kentucky a few years ago, and it was spearheaded by our central IT um, academic technology team. It sounds like you had a very rigorous research study approach, sure. and I was wondering if you could talk a little about who was on the team, yes. and you know, was it a partnership between IT and, and college and faculty, and so how, how did you create that partnership? So, that's a good question. Uh, my, one of my mentors, so Professor Kathy Shu uh, was a mentor of mine, when I, I, so my PhD is in education from Iowa. Um, because she has an educational psychology background, we recruited her to do this study with us to help us design it. Um, and Jane Russell is also has a PhD in educational psychology. So, um, so our training being in education helped, but we also had to seek out, some people talked about teaching elementary reading, or someone talked about that briefly, and what we found, we actually looked around and we couldn't find like a, a good measure that applies to adults for reading behavior. I went to our education library and there was tons of information about kids. There's all this, there are all these scales, there are all these little tests, but we finally tracked down this reading behavior questionnaire that was published in the literature um, <clears throat> that we found to use. So, uh, so we, we, we were lucky in that because we had the grant, the grant required us to design a study and have external people vet the study as well before, as a condition of getting the money. So that, uh, somewhat behaviorist incentive uh, helped us a lot because it actually helped us think things through and, it, and, 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 we, and a lot of our research is done this way. We have education people work with us because they bring a very good perspective. Um, they, um, they're not technology people so they don't have the same biases that exist in my group which is very helpful um, to checking those biases and ensuring that you're looking at the, at the data fairly and not just being happy with shiny, shiny things. So I believe I'm out of time, but I will be up here if you have any other questions or comments, and if you'd like to approach, I will thank you for your participation and for your willingness to read about biology, the two of you, and, uh, uh, and thank you for very much in the, in the middle of the dais. I'm not sure if people thank you, but thank you for all your help as well. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>